to our final presentation in our 2021 International Symposium. For our keynote this afternoon, we are extremely pleased and honored to have Ambassador Ryan Crocker joining us to talk about the future of diplomacy in this country. I wanna apologize for us being a few minutes late to get started, but it was for a very good reason. Ambassador Crocker just this moment returned from delivering testimony to the House Foreign Affairs Committee on the topic of restoring diplomacy and development in a fractured world. So he was just talking about this with our uh, elected representatives and now he's gonna be talking about it with us. So let me give you a few words of introduction and then I'll turn it over to Ambassador Crocker. So my name is Kathleen Fairfax. I am the Vice Provost for International Affairs at Colorado State University. And my office, the Office of International Programs is hosting this international symposium. So Ambassador Crocker has a very distinguished foreign service career. Um, he has served as a US ambassador six times in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon. He retired from the Foreign Service in April 2009 after a career of over 37 years, but was recalled to active duty by President Obama to serve as the U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan in 2011. But since joining the Foreign Service in 1971, besides those six posts as Ambassador, he has also held assignments in Iran, Qatar, Iraq, Egypt, as well as Washington, D.C. Ambassador Crocker received the highest, uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the nation's highest civilian award in 2009. So before we get started, I would just like to read you a brief uh, excerpt from um, what was said when Ambassador Crocker received his award. For nearly four decades, Ryan Crocker has advanced our nation's interests and ideals around the world. Embodying the highest principles of the United States Foreign Service, he has cultivated and enhanced our relations with pivotal nations. Following the attacks of September 11, 2001, he worked to build a worldwide coalition to combat terrorism and help millions of oppressed people travel the path to liberty and democracy. The United States honors Ryan C. Crocker for his courage, his integrity, and his unwavering commitment to strengthening our nation and building a freer and more peaceful world. So we are extremely honored, Ambassador Crocker, to have you with us this afternoon, and I look forward to hear it. I look forward to hearing your remarks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fairfax. It's a pleasure to be back uh, at Colorado State, even if just virtually. Um, and I'm delighted to um, have been asked to participate in this important program. Uh, coming out of the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee hearing, um, I, I find myself encouraged. This, this was the first um, hearing of the full committee for the 117th Congress, and they tackled the big issues um, uh, of American leadership, particularly in diplomacy and development. And of course, that is exactly what you were doing here or have asked me to do here, uh, the future of diplomacy. Uh, <clears throat> A diplomacy is a tool, it's not an end in itself, although some of my colleagues seem to think it is. Um, it's about ways of getting things done in the world. Um, and I, I'd like to start by just a, <clears throat> a kind of a brief historical reminder to us all. Um, uh, if we go back a hundred years to uh, the end of World War I, which was the first major step the United States took on the world stage, uh, uh, joining the war late, uh, but joining it decisively for an allied victory. Uh, so we were very much present on the field. We were not very much present um, in the peace that followed the war. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was at Versailles, uh, but he was um, sidelined by the leaders of France and uh, the UK, who were grateful for American assistance on the battlefield, but did not want us uh, horning in on uh, uh, their turf, which was much of the rest of the world. Uh, at the same time, the 1918 elections returned an isolationist Senate. So Woodrow Wilson's great dream of the League of Nations was realized in the formal sense 
but our uh, absence uh, effectively doomed the organization. What did we get? Well, what led us to World War I was a balance of power system, uh, which worked just fine until it didn't. Uh, and the world blew up, Europe blew up. Um, and we got no fundamental systemic change after World War I, two decades of peace more or less. And then we had World War II just 20 years later. Um, we learned from that. Uh, while the war was still going on, we were taking the steps to position ourselves as the global leader. Uh, things like the San Francisco conference that produced the United Nations, the Bretton Woods Agreement um, in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire that um, uh, redid the international financial order and moved the world effectively from the gold standard to the dollar. NATO, a few years later. We, we conceived of these institutions, we helped to create them, and then we led. Uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, successive administrations, um, all saw America as a global leader. And, and so we were. Did we do it perfectly? By no means. Think of Vietnam, uh, think of Iraq. Uh, but our leadership did provide security and stability seven and a half decades without uh, uh, another global conflict. Uh, that actually started to change under President Obama. Um, uh, when uh, he declined to play a global role in the refugee crisis, 2015, 2016, um, it, weakened Europe considerably, a weakness that, that still exists. But at the same time, he executed things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a hugely important agreement at the time we joined it, uh, that really contained an isolated China uh, in an East Asian con context. Uh, he, uh, he signed the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, the, uh, a critically important step if we're going to save the world, quite literally. And he negotiated and signed the Joint <coughs> uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, otherwise known as the Iran nuclear deal, that significantly reduced uh, the nuclear threat. Um, uh, President Trump undid all of those agreements. Uh, and by the time he left office, uh, I would suggest that uh, America had isolated itself. Um, that uh, uh, we were by default allowing a balance of power system to reassert itself. What's wrong with that? Two world wars is wrong with that. Uh, as I look at the landscape today, we, we talk a lot about China. Um, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of China leading the world in our place uh, because it can't. It, uh, it, it may have the economic power. It does not have the tools of diplomacy. Uh, uh, it is really the view that just throw money at it and it'll go your way. Um, well, that's not actually how diplomacy works. So uh, we are at a hinge of history, in my view. Um, uh, the Biden administration, I think, is working very hard to, to reassert a, a global leadership role for us. Uh, but particularly after the last four years, that is, uh, that is not a given. Uh, where we have stepped back, powers like China and Russia have stepped forward. Uh, regional powers uh, felt that they could not look to the United States for much of anything during that period, um, began to make their own decisions, their own judgments, take their own actions. So there's a lot to be done here, and we are talking about global security. Uh, uh, it is an existential question. I do believe that the administration is committed to making a difference, to using diplomacy toward the end of an American global leadership uh, that makes a difference. Uh, a great place to start, both at home and abroad, would be the COVID pandemic. Stunning to me, a half a million dead Americans. Uh, in a year. 
uh, which is more than our combat casualties in two world wars plus Vietnam. Uh, uh, the world is reeling under this impact. Uh, it is a global pandemic. Uh, it, it, we are going to see, I think, uh, President Biden move to provide some global leadership. Um, it won't be easy. Uh, anything important is generally that way. So the future of diplomacy, it depends on the future America sees uh, for its role in the world. Uh, we, we do know how to do leadership. We've done it for decades. The State Department, of course, has been um, devastated during the four years of the Trump administration. It is going to have to be restructured and rebuilt, not just to be what it used to be. It needs to be a, a State Department and a foreign service for the 21st century. And indeed, there is a, uh, a very detailed report on just that recently put out uh, by the uh, Belfer Center at Harvard University. Um, so again, diplomacy to what end? Uh, uh, we need to rebuild the Foreign Service. We need to strengthen it. It has been starved of resources. Um, we need to change the way we look at what the Foreign Service is. We need to take uh, into account um, the demographics. We need to have a foreign service that looks more like America. I um, noted with interest, I was on a panel with uh, three other very distinguished uh, individuals, um, uh, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, <coughs> Gail Smith, and uh, Ruben uh, Brigitte, uh, now the uh, head of the <coughs> University of the South in Tennessee. And um, uh, they, so none of the other members of that four person panel looked like me. Um, I was the only white, old, I was the only old white guy there. Uh, uh, and I find that an encouraging development. So not just to rebuild, but to build something that's kind of, kind of new and different that reflects uh, who we are as a, as a nation and um, as a, um, as a people. So. Again, diplomacy to what end? I, I hope and pray it is diplomacy uh, to the end of recreating, refashioning, uh, uh, reconceiving of an American leadership role in the 21st century world, which has as many dangers and evils as um, uh, that of the last century. Because here again, I, I worry about complacency. Uh, we look at things like the Holocaust, the, the murder of, of six million Jews, and then add another million to that of other uh, minorities executed in a genocidal campaign because of who they were. Uh, um, it's still in living memory, the Holocaust. Do we honestly believe never again as, as we look at regressive tendencies, certainly in Russia, but also other former East Bloc countries like, uh, like Hungary and Romania. Uh, uh, the forces of authoritarianism are still strong. They don't go away. They have to be countered. Uh, in the case of Hungary, I'm on the board of directors for Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, created in the immediate post-war period to counter Soviet uh, misinformation and disinformation. Um, for a time, we considered just abolishing Radio Free Europe in a, uh, a decade or so ago in a more peaceful time. Uh, Radio Free Europe is now broadcasting in Hungarian uh, because of our concerns that the Hungarian people under authoritarian leadership are no longer able to access independent and objective news. Uh, yet Hungary is a part of NATO. So, you know, I, I fear the past. I fear the past becoming the future. And the only way I can see to uh, avoid this really is for us to return again to our traditional leadership role. Um, uh, as President Biden famously said before, before the election, the world doesn't organize itself. Uh, you let it drift at your peril. And I, I would give you an example from more recent history in the, uh, <clears throat> in the 1990s, mid 1990s, when uh, 
the Balkans blew up. Uh, uh, President Clinton's view initially was that this is a European problem. Uh, the Europeans need to figure out how to fix it. And uh, that was a perfectly valid point of view, except that the Europeans couldn't do it. Uh, that was brought home, I think, to the world with the horrific uh, massacre of something like 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys at Srebrenica, while a United Nations peacekeeping force literally looked on. Uh, that's when the president decided we had to step in. And we did. Uh, and that produced the Dayton Accords of uh, uh, late 1995. And that would be Dayton, Ohio, not, not Dayton, France. So if you think there could never be another Holocaust, OK, we'll let that one ride. Do you think there could be another Balkans explosion uh, with us out of the picture? You bet there could. Uh, so again, it's a critical issue at a critical time. Um, and it's wonderful to see uh, this great university really sees that problem by, by putting together this whole symposium. Uh, it's all about America's place in the world, region by region, strategically, tactically. Uh, this is a conversation we, we really need to have and we need to have it right now. Uh, so, what do we need uh, for the Foreign Service? Uh, first, to understand what it is and what it does. Our, our strongest advocates, uh, particularly in, in recent years, uh, have been military leaders. Because they, uh, they, they know what we do and they know how much of what we do uh, uh, is synchronized to uh, support what, what they are asked to do. I was on a uh, a conference call just yesterday with um, retired General uh, Joe Votel, uh, who was um, commander of US Special Forces and then um, uh, commander of Central Command, the uh, command that looks over the Middle East and, and South Asia. Uh, his number one concern, we have many key countries in the region at which we do not have a confirmed ambassador. Uh, that, is, that is very true. That was his most important concern, that we did not have the diplomatic strength in place uh, to manage these relationships, to coordinate with our military, to figure out the best way forward in a pretty tangled political forest. Um, so it's not, and in my mind, it has never been, it's not uh, diplomacy versus defense. Uh, it has to be diplomacy and defense and development. And again, uh, those who understand it best uh, and those who have pressed hardest uh, for just that paradigm are those who wear our nation's uniform. Uh, so again, it's uh, if we have a militarized foreign policy, trust me, it was not the military who did it. Uh, the military were called upon by a civilian leadership uh, to play roles that they would be the first to tell you. Uh, they weren't really trained and equipped uh, uh, to execute. Um, they want to see a lot more of us, not a, a lot less of us. Uh, I saw that with, um, uh, with uh, now Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. He was Corps Commander in Iraq. Uh, give me more USAID officers, development officers. We didn't have them because it's been hollowed out. So. Item one, not just rebuild, uh, but re-envision uh, and structure a different foreign service, a foreign service that at senior levels uh, has um, far fewer people uh, who look like me uh, and far more people who don't. Uh, again, gender, race, ethnicity, that, that's what makes America strong. Uh, and that's what your foreign service needs to look like. Um, one other thing I would say here is uh, a subject we don't talk about very much in the public domain, uh, it's risk. And, and really what I'm saying here effectively is for the leadership of today and tomorrow by the United States, two things are necessary. They both begin with an R, resources 
which I've just, just discussed, and risk. Um, I've, taken, uh, I've taken a few risks in the course of my career. I, I saw risk as something to be managed. It, it can't be avoided uh, if you're doing your job. If we are going to practice diplomacy in the places most crucial for our national security and our national defense, uh, you gotta take some risks. Uh, I, I saw that in Iraq and Afghanistan and Lebanon at a different time. Um, uh, you, gotta, you gotta know that uh, you may lose some people out there. Uh, we do everything we can to avoid it, but it, it has to be about, uh, again, management and avoidance, not a zero sum uh, view that uh, there cannot be any uh, losses ever. Um, and, and we saw this, frankly, uh, with appalling clarity on the, uh, the case to, <laughs> of the, uh, the murder of my old friend and colleague, Chris Stevens in Benghazi in um, August, 2012. Uh, uh, the last time I counted, I think we've been up to 10 different investigations that added absolutely no clarity to the uh, um, uh, actual needs of security needs of the Foreign Service. That's that's unfair. The first accountability review board convened uh, was uh, headed by former Ambassador Tom Pickering, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mike Mullen. Uh, it concluded that there had been some bad mistakes, uh, and uh, some people lost their jobs over it. Uh, some bureaucratic lines were cleaned up to to prevent a um, a further such incident. But then it got political. And the consequence of these multiple Benghazi hearings has been to create an atmosphere in the State Department uh, that is completely risk adverse because the, the signal sent was that if um, somebody gets killed on your watch uh, and the, you're the Secretary of State or another senior official, um, uh, it will be because you did something wrong. The very fact that someone was killed uh, in service to the country means there was criminal intent or negligence there. Well, what that means is no one will take a chance. Not because they're afraid of injury or death, uh, but because of the politics. And uh, that is frankly crippling. We, we, we have got to find a way uh, out of this trap we set for ourselves. And that was a point I, uh, I hit pretty hard on with uh, uh, in my hearing just now because it, it, it Congress set up the current system. Uh, Congress is going to have to fix it. It can't be done by executive order. It, it's going to take a new or um, heavily amended law. Uh, so you know that's that's um, kind of how I see where we are at an absolutely pivotal moment in world history. Uh, uh, do we lead or do we not? What are the consequences if we do? What are the dangers if we don't? <clears throat> it's pretty clear where I stand on this. And I kind of look forward to your, uh, uh, your questions and, <clears throat> and comments. Um, but that's it in a uh, nutshell, in the, um, uh, the way I perceive the problem uh, uh, <clears throat> um, and the world. Uh, we are a democracy in spite of, um, you know, some of the recent setbacks like the appalling attack on the Capitol on, on January 6th, uh, but we are, we are America. Um, a lot of bad things have happened. Uh, uh, we have as a people and as a government over the years done some pretty bad stuff, but we do learn. Uh, we have incredible resilience, uh, incredible potential. And this is a time to demonstrate that we have learned those lessons and that uh, uh, we are prepared to profit from that learning. Moving ahead for our own sake, for the sake of our values, for the sake of our interests, and for the sake of uh, <coughs> global security and stability. So I'll, I'll pause there and this will now get much more interesting because I get to hear from you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Crocker. I, I greatly appreciate the very interesting uh, comments. And I forgot to mention at the beginning for our audience members, please feel free to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. 
if you would like to ask a question of Ambassador Cocker and I will be relaying questions to him. So I've already gotten a few. So uh, first question is how much of the State Department's acceptance and influence on the world stage can realistically be accomplished in the short term, such so as two years before the next uh, Congress is um, established or four years during the Biden presidency? Well, that goes to the heart of the matter. It, it is an excellent question. Uh, uh, we have some challenges that are hardwired into our system. Uh, uh, the kind of the, the maximum period for uh, a coherent policy to uh, be guaranteed is eight years, uh, two terms uh, for a presidency. But in reality, it doesn't work that way. It takes at least the first year for an administration to, to organize itself, to get the right people in the right places, to mulch through policy options and, and, and really set in motion uh, uh, a coherent uh, national security policy and foreign policy. Uh, then of course, on, in Congress with the uh, now continuous election cycle, uh, to your terms for our representatives, uh, they are in full campaign mode all of the time. Uh, and it makes it extremely difficult uh, for even the most capable and best intentioned, inten best intentioned uh, uh, representatives to uh, have the bandwidth and the opportunity to drill down hard and deep on some of these uh, really important questions. So it, uh, comes an issue again of the long view of strategic patience, as I like to call it, that, uh, uh, that there will be continuity in key relationships and key priorities as there was, uh, as I was noting earlier, uh, with respect to US post-World War II leadership. Now, that was a Republican and a Democratic imperative. So we need to find our way back to that. And again, it's going to be hard. Uh, Long ago, administration stopped sending complicated treaties to the Senate for ratification. That part of the system hasn't worked for quite a long time. So it's done by executive order instead. I, I negotiated important agreements in both Iraq and in Afghanistan, and in both countries, important enough for President Bush in Iraq to come to Baghdad, President Obama um, uh, to come to Kabul to sign the agreements. Uh, in both cases, they required parliamentary ratification by, by the Iraqi government uh, and by the Afghan government. And in both countries, I was asked, uh, okay, we have gone through this exhausting process to bring our parliaments formally on board. All you've done is affix a presidential signature to it. And what is done with the stroke of a pen can be undone by the stroke of a pen. And my answer was, theoretically, that's possible, but it has never happened uh, on a uh, international agreement. Well, now it has. Uh, uh, President Trump undid by executive order uh, our uh, involvement with the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership with um, the Paris Climate Accords and with the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, so it's, gonna, it's going to complicate effective diplomacy far, far into the future. Uh, uh, again, for short-term political advantage, we have seen too many times the sacrifice of our long-term strategic needs. Are you still with me? There we go. I was muted. Now I'm still with you. Sorry about <laughs> oh. that. <laughs> You the think problem that, uh, not learned that. No, it's in my, my end. So the next question we have is about uh, China. So uh, the question is that dealing with a, a, threat, a threatening PRC is a big problem, economically, politi politically, militarily. How do we separate the problems that we have dealing with the PRC as a country versus Chinese people, both in the US and in China, where they are often demonized? Again, a great question on, on, uh, on multiple levels. Uh, uh, 
and it is absolutely a question we need to think about. Uh, to say the least, we've had a, a few problems with our uh, treatment of people who don't look like us. Uh, uh, and in the case of um, East Asia, you know, we had the scandalous uh, process of interning Japanese Americans uh, uh, during World War II. Uh, uh, and for China, uh, we had something called the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, basically saying, uh, if, if you're Chinese or you look Chinese or we think you look Chinese, you're not coming to this country. That was on the books from like the 1880s up until 1943. Uh, and it, it changed only because uh, uh, China had emerged as a critical ally uh, in the, the war in, uh, uh, in, uh, in East Asia. So sadly, there's a history here that isn't very pretty. Uh, and uh, you, you are so right to flag the issue. Uh, uh, given our past uh, and given some of the currents that still flow through American society, not too hard to imagine that uh, a policy that uh, uh, ostensibly aimed at or necessarily aimed at the uh, containment of China, the development of um, alliances and understandings that would work to that end that would reduce uh, uh, Chinese malign uh, actions and minimize their impact, have that not bleed over into uh, uh, something that is derogative <clears throat> of the Chinese as a people. Uh, that again would, in my view, compromise some, some uh, crucial American values. And if you wanna be more pragmatic about it, uh, uh, it's a great way to turn a whole lot of people that are not our enemies into enemies. Uh, so it is something we've got to be very watchful for because uh, uh, it is all too easy to <clears throat> slip into that mode. We, we saw rhetoric, of course, uh, coming out of the White House during the, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the COVID buildup uh, that uh, talked about the China virus. Uh, you know, uh, that leads you nowhere good. Not, again, not in terms of our values and not in terms of our security. And sadly, we know that because we've been there before. We have got to resolve in this process that we will not go back there. Thank you uh, for that. Another question, uh, you touched on the issue of how important it is to have a foreign service that reflects American society. But since the lack of diversity in the Foreign Service and in the State Department has been a rather long-term issue, an intractable issue in some ways, what do you think would help? What would get more diverse representation and more young people from diverse backgrounds interested in diplomatic careers? There are several things that <clears throat> uh, we, we can do. There's several things we've been doing that with uh, more resources we could amp up. Uh, to have greater impact. For example, we have a program called uh, Diplomats in Residence, uh, senior foreign service officers spending um, a couple of years on the campus of uh, major universities. And increasingly uh, with these assignments, uh, we, are, we are sending diplomats in residence and they are active duty <coughs> foreign service officers <coughs> to uh, 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 historically, underserved colleges and universities so that um, there will be a chance for young people who <clears throat> may not even know they have a foreign service, uh, uh, let alone that they might ever be able to join it to, um, to, for, to, to make these young Americans aware of, of what the service is and what it does and how, yes, they could join it. Uh, so I, I, to, to increase that significantly, I, I think would be, would be important. Um, uh, Colorado, maybe not so much as Eastern Washington, where I am near Spokane, <clears throat> flyover country. Uh, when I joined the Foreign Service a uh, million years ago, I, I actually counted for diversity 
because I was not from the West Coast or the East Coast and I didn't go to an Ivy League school. Um, uh, so uh, from that um, era in the Stone Age, we actually have made progress. We've certainly done better with the uh, gender <clears throat> uh, than we have with race and ethnicity, <clears throat> but that also shows a way forward that uh, you know, when there is a will to actively uh, uh, promote diversity, uh, uh, you can do it. So that um, uh, while women are still, I think, badly underrepresented in the very top uh, tiers of the foreign service, uh, you are seeing more and more uh, women coming into the service and advancing up through its ranks. So uh, we, uh, I think we're on the right path on uh, gender equity issues. By no means uh, time to say we've got that done, don't have to worry about it anymore. It's still a work in progress. Uh, but I think there are some lessons there. And uh, you know, one thing that was in a recent report uh, um, of, of having kind of a, a diplomatic ROTC program at, at selected universities uh, to um, uh, not just make um, uh, underserved student populations aware of a foreign service and, and how you might join it, but to sort of go through a, an educational process of uh, what's it all about? What do you need to know? How do you need to, uh, to work it and so forth? So it, that would be one initiative that is being talked about right now and one that I think has considerable merit. Thank you. Um, sort of related question in terms of involving young people in our nation service. Um, this question, I, you probably are aware, but CSU, Colorado State, played a major role in the initial planning for the Peace Corps. Um, and it's been a major source of Peace Corps volunteers in the 60 years since. All Peace Corps volunteers were brought home last year at the start of the pandemic. Do you think it's time to re-envision re the Peace Corps? And I know you've dealt and worked alongside and seen Peace Corps volunteers in action in your various posts overseas. And if we re-envision it, is it another avenue for national service? Uh, uh, yes, it absolutely is. Peace Corps is a great institution. I, I almost joined it. Um, uh, had been um, identified as uh, uh, someone who would go to Afghanistan, actually, um, but the Foreign Service paid better. Uh, but I've uh, long admired the volunteers and the program itself and have, uh, as you know, it, I, uh, I, I've worked with them whenever I've had the chance. Uh, here again, I, I think uh, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-phased question. Uh, should we return Peace Corps volunteers to the world? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we, we should use this pause though, as the question suggests, to think about the mission, the fundamental missions for the Peace Corps. What do we wanna emphasize here? Um, we are obviously, the Peace Corps is there to uh, develop uh, uh, capacities of different sorts uh, in um, poorer countries. Uh, but it's also about developing things in this country. Uh, Peace Corps volunteers go on to do great things. Uh, and in many cases, their Peace Corps experience is what then set them on a road to accomplishment uh, in, in later life. So uh, it's a good time to ask both questions, uh, to re-envision or reimagine a Peace Corps uh, for the 21st century, just as effort is being made on reimagining diplomacy for the 21st century. But here again, we've got to be careful too uh, uh, in risk aversion. Uh, you know, Peace Corps volunteers are out there on the edge. Uh, uh, if they're not uh, involved in a conflict, uh, they are nonetheless in places where uh, health and sanitation conditions are not optimal, where there may be problems with uh, uh, pure drinking water and uncontaminated food and so forth. Uh, uh, I, I would hate to see the risk aversion that has so uh, stifled the foreign service also spill over into the way we look at uh, uh, where and how our wonderful Peace Corps volunteers operate. Uh, that uh, risk is part of the deal. Uh, one way that uh, we explored 
uh, at one point how to manage that was in the case of Afghanistan. The uh, then Peace Corps director visited me in Kabul uh, in um, early 2002, kind of the creation. And, and we talked about uh, having a, um, uh, a, a Peace Corps graduate effort in which former Peace Corps volunteers who had gone on uh, to careers in which they uh, developed and contributed to various aspects of our society, whether through financial management, uh, medicine, whatever, uh, and um, uh, were now at or approaching retirement, would they be interested in coming back in as kind of volunteers emeritus? To, uh, to lend their uh, highly developed expertise uh, into situations that badly needed those skills. Uh, that, uh, and maybe Afghanistan could be a, uh, a first approach at it because it turns out that Afghan Peace Corps volunteers are, have stayed wonderfully relevant and engaged in a fascinating country to have a chance to use skills developed later in life uh, uh, to the advantage, again, of, uh, of the Afghan people. So it'd be worth taking another look at that as a, um, as a concrete example. But uh, the Peace Corps is one of our great strengths. And uh, those of you at Colorado State can be very, very proud of being present at the creation. Thank you. And I, that leads into another question. You were, you were mentioning with the Peace Corps and the fact that People who have been Peace Corps volunteers return a, a rich amount of experience to the U.S. society, and so it's it's a benefit to us, not just to the outside world. So our next question is: What about the opposite? Is there a role for foreign service and diplomacy in shaping internal U.S. policies? For example, U.S. immigration policy. Uh, yes, that's a that's another great question, and uh, uh, this this would be a moment. It's already clear that uh, President Biden has as a top priority uh, overhauling our immigration restrictions, uh, uh, as well as uh, our restrictions on refugee resettlement, something I'm uh, involved in up, up here in uh, Eastern Washington. Uh, this could be a very important element of it uh, for uh, former Peace Corps volunteers to um, work to fashion a message of you know, why, why global engagement, not simply at the uh, strategic or, or diplomatic level, but what the Peace Corps always was uh, designed to do person to person, how, how the lessons learned by uh, uh, Peace Corps volunteers uh, on the, the contributions that uh, others can make to their own societies and to ours, uh, I think that could be a very powerful part of a um, uh, of a concerted campaign to uh, have immigration work for the benefit of immigrants and for the country, our country, to which they are immigrating to. Uh, you know, the, the Peace Corps has a lot of respect in this country, rightfully, uh, and I think it'd be great for the administration. Uh, I, I don't know if a new director has been named, uh, but. Uh, through that avenue to, to uh, be part of a broad gauged, carefully crafted coalition, immigration coalition, if you will, uh, to de demonize the uh, uh, stigmas attached to immigration and to uh, try to have a, uh, a policy that, uh, that makes sense, again, both individually and for the national interest. Thank you. So this question, you, you talked about a tiny bit in your uh, talk, but maybe you can elaborate on it. So this uh, um, audience member says, we missed an opportunity when we backed out of the TPP. Um, what are the politics and diplomatic hurdles for re-engaging in the alliance? And if we can't do it through the TPP, how can we secure influence in the far Pacific? Uh, again, a critical question. Um, well, it, it, it starts again with uh, forming some of our own thinking, but as part of that process of uh, rethinking these things for ourselves, we need to consult with others. 
to uh, to spend time in these initial uh, weeks and months of administra administration to get out to the region to to talk to um, uh, our traditional partners, for example, in East Asia. Uh, how, how do they see the role of China? Uh, uh, what do they think uh, an effective uh, U.S. posture might be? What are the upsides? What are the downsides? What should we do? What should we avoid? Uh, uh, again, that uh, I'm afraid that train has left the station. Uh, we do not now have the uh, the structure that uh, was uh, that was set up and which uh, President Obama took full advantage of. Uh, so again, uh, I'm, I'm not sure now what, what our options are, uh, but a great way to find out would be go talk to others who may be uh, living a little closer to the problem. I, I'm a Middle East uh, specialist, if you will. I don't really know much about uh, East Asia. I did make a visit to, um, to Vietnam a few years ago and uh, had the chance to meet a uh, deputy foreign minister in Hanoi. Um, who uh, in a stroll through the garden said, you know, uh, we've um, tried to maintain the base at Kamran Bay uh, as best we can and to utilize it, but it's far bigger than our needs. Do uh, you ever think about maybe the US Navy coming back? And I stopped and I looked at him and said, um, you know, we had this little unpleasantness called the Vietnam War. Um, and Kamran Bay featured as a pretty important base for us in prosecuting that war. And, uh, he just, he brushed that off. He said, okay, so you add, add the Americans and the French going back to the early fifties and Dien Bien Phu, maybe we were at some kind of war footing for possibly two decades. Uh, you know, we've been fighting the Chinese for a thousand years. Um, so could be good for both of our national security postures. Uh, it's a complex place, uh, the uh, East Asia, as is the Middle East, which I know lamentably little about, uh, but was struck by that, that um, uh, listen, you know, walk in with your mouth shut and your ears open, uh, and listen to leaders, listen to uh, uh, regular citizens of these countries. Uh, what, do they, uh, what do they fear with respect to China? How best to come up with uh, steps and policies and procedures to mitigate that. So it's been a hallmark of mine. It does not normally figure as a major attribute for American diplomacy. Again, um, eyes and ears open, mouth shut. Thank you. And I know we're about out of time and I know you've had a very busy day so far. So I'm gonna ask you one last question. Uh, this is from a student wants to know how you would recommend beginning a career in politics, international or otherwise, to someone who might wanna pursue that after graduation, but isn't wealthy, doesn't have family connections, and, and seems to, a lot of people seem to think that's the only way you can actually make it in this political type environment. What advice would you have to young people? Um, well, first, uh, have those, long-term goals, those dreams, those visions. Uh, um, you know, we, we all need something to aspire to. So dream the biggest dream you can. Uh, uh, would love to see more, uh, more dreaming by young people uh, about the, uh, the, uh, the globe as a whole, the international sphere. Uh, and then in moving toward that dream, to figure out paths that uh, are meaningful to you. Uh, a really bad idea, uh, uh, for example, would be young folks who join the Foreign Service and their goal is to be an ambassador. It's not a good idea. Um, uh, you know, a lot of very talented officers uh, do not become ambassadors, in part because our, our system is unique. Uh, in that 25, 30, 35% of ambassadors are so-called political appointees, uh, not chosen from the, the ranks of the Foreign Service, but chosen because of their attachment to a particular administration in power. Um, 
uh, not a good system, ask any career officer, but it is our system and it can, uh, it can mean that if you join the Foreign Service with the sole purpose of becoming an ambassador, uh, you, you could be very disappointed at the end of the day. So dream your dream, uh, but in the steps that might lead you to the fulfillment of that dream, every step you take should be something that intrinsically is important to you. That uh, you, know, you don't take X assignment or Y assignment. You don't wanna to go to those countries anyway, but you take them because uh, somebody said it might advance your path to the top. Again, not a good idea. Life is too short, uh, uh, have the dream, but figure out steps that will um, uh, take you toward it, but that are also meaningful and fulfilling in their own right. And again, you know, we, we are, the Foreign Service is a meritocracy. Um, uh, you know, nobody is looking at your bank balance or who you contributed to. Uh, and for some, it is a, uh, it's an avenue to things in politics um, uh, or in academics. Uh, you know, a, a few years in the Foreign Service, you learn a lot, and it may be that that tells you that what you really want to do is get into the political side of it and run for office. Uh, got a friend up here in Washington State who just did that. So again, um, you know, think big, dream big, uh, but make sure that the steps on the path you would ultimately like to reach the culmination of that each one of those steps be rewarding in its own right. Thank you. I think those are very inspirational words. And to, to close, I wonder if you have any closing remarks for us, particularly I'm thinking about how you very first opened your remarks by saying that you feel optimistic. Despite all the problems that we've talked about over the last hour and a half, you feel optimistic about the future of diplomacy. Uh, for the United States. Maybe just tell us again why, and then we will thank you for your contribution. Um, uh, I, feel, I feel optimistic about the future of the United States, uh, that uh, uh, after going through this hearing, and uh, again, looking at uh, uh, an historic moment. Uh, as I said, this was the uh, first uh, full committee meeting of the 117th Congress. Um, and it was the uh, first meeting over which uh, Chairman Meeks uh, presided. Uh, Chairman Meeks is an African American. Uh, you know, he has been on the Foreign Relations Committee for many years. I first met him, God, at least a dozen years ago, and he stuck with that. And, and now he is um, um, a leading figure in uh, the world of international policy. Um, a lot of other, I hope, a lot of other. Uh, young African American people are going to look at Gregory Meeks and say, "He's there. I can do that." Uh, so again, these things count. Uh, they 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 count hugely. The other thing that struck me, and this has been a hallmark of the committee uh, <clears throat> for uh, <clears throat> for some time, uh, I, I got again this very clear sense of bipartisan purpose. Uh, the uh, ranking. A uh, Republican member of the committee couldn't be at the hearing because he was at the White House at the uh, invitation of President Biden. Um, members on both sides of the aisle spoke of uh, uh, the need for bipartisanship and uh, clear that they intended to practice that. Now they are not immune to the hyperpartisanship we've we've seen in this country, uh, <clears throat> but they certainly can be part of the solution to take us back to that old adage that sadly is no longer applicable that uh, political differences stop at the water's edge. You know, whatever our differences are internally, that when we go abroad, uh, when we play a role abroad, uh, particularly by members of Congress, it is about American national security, not about American domestic politics. So I, uh, I, found, that, I found that very, very encouraging. We are a great country. Uh, we can get through some pretty terrible things sometimes. Uh, and I guess I would just conclude by um, uh, a comment that uh, Congressman Malinowski made that looking at January 6th and the insurrection. Uh, and he, he just asked us all to, to imagine um, a situation in Russia um, in which President Putin 
lost a democratic election. Um, and then President Putin would call political operatives around the country saying, go find me uh, another few tens of thousands of votes. And they all say, nothing doing guy, your history, you're done. We're not gonna do that. Uh, and then um, the defeated President Putin uh, says to his, uh, uh, his supporters, go, uh, go take the White House, go take the Russian parliament building um, and we'll proclaim the new Republic. Well, a few misguided uh, Russians uh, break into the White House, look around at each other and then drift away. And then the full force of the Russian state comes down on them. Try to imagine that. Well, you can't because it will never happen in Russia. Uh, it happened in America. It was a horrible moment, but our resilience and our follow-up, I think have demonstrated the weaknesses of our society, but also the overwhelming strength of it. It's, it's, uh, it's morning in America all over again. We've got the problems, uh, we acknowledge them, we aim to do better, and we do do better. Thank you, Ambassador Crocker, and thank you all for participating in our session, our keynote this afternoon. As a reminder to everyone, when the meeting ends, a pop-up will appear for you to uh, provide an evaluation if you would be so kind to do so. And uh, once the pandemic is over, Ambassador Crocker, we hope to have you back on campus at some point. I look forward to it. You've got a great campus, great students, hey, and great restaurants. That's right, and great <laughs> beer. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon.